In this film series, we look into five Celtic port towns that are connected and intertwined by the ferry routes that serve them. To get to know the history of these routes, the wonderful wildlife, and the relationships that they continue to nourish, we meet up with Welsh and Irish locals who show us how they're inspired by this fascinating crossing. At the water's edge, stories of the Irish Sea. A lot of the history is where we're standing. You can go to places where pirates landed. We were the last town in Britain to be invaded by pirates. We were the last town in Britain to be invaded by a continental army. It happened here on the spot where we're standing. It seems an odd thing to have in my pocket, but it came from a pirate ship, it stayed on, on the end there and fired its cannon into the town with the idea of getting the town to pay them money. The town wouldn't. One of these cannonballs lodged in a chimney in one of the pubs in town. The locals borrowed a cannon from a ship which is in the harbour. They brought it up to this place here so they could fire down onto the pirates. And so the pirates immediately turned tail and went. Because of the pirate attack, the town asked the government for cannon. And those four big cannon over there were provided by the government for the town to protect it from pirates. So this is a very interesting place in terms of getting a handle on the town history. Eastern shore, oh yes, oh, 100 years and an Eastern When I go to play music with my friends, I really enjoy the, the part of the evening where we have sea shanties. The shanties were there to give entertainment because in the days when these things were written down, there was no radio, no television, and no record players. A lot of our history is entangled with that set of stories and songs that go with these sea shanties. Fishguard as a, as a town is part of what's called a peninsula culture. Peninsula cultures are where the peninsula has preserved the culture of the people who live on it. With Fishguard, that remained true in the sense that there was lots of folk music here. And as a consequence, we thought the best thing to do was uh, to try and have a once a year big festival where we could cope with all the, the numbers of people coming. I look out my window every day and I'm surrounded by inspiration. I'm quite close to the coastal path, so people walk past here all the time as well. And just whether it's the weather or the time of year or the people that are about, everything's always changing. There's always something that you can take inspiration from. In the whole last invasion history, our heroine, Jemima, she saw a lot of these drunken soldiers and went down with her pitchfork and she rounded them up, marched them back up this hill into Fishguard. And then when they surrendered, they actually took them back down to Goodick. On the bicentenary, Elizabeth Cramp was asked to design, make a commemorative tapestry. So she designed this and a whole army of local ladies did all this stitching and it depicts the whole thing from when they invaded right the way through to Jemima and then the treaty being signed at the Royal Oak. So it's quite an important piece of local history that we're really proud of.
we're at Cummeraglois and it's just a really beautiful little bay and it's quite well known really for the church building that's only just left standing, there's only one more left and that's St Brunach's Church. There was a big storm back in 1859 and loads of boats were lost out to sea and one of the boats was the Royal Charter which was lost off North Wales but lots of boats were also lost off the West Wales coast and the storm destroyed the church so the remains are here now. So it's just a really scenic place to come and swim. I'd heard about this group of people called the Blue Tits that were wild swimmers but I was really nervous about finding out more about them because I just assumed they'd all be really fit and really fast swimmers. So the decision to start the swimming was something that I'd thought about for a long time but didn't really have the guts to actually initiate it. But when it did happen, it really has been life-changing. Here we are at the moment um, next to the field with the first flight to Ireland. It was achieved by uh, Dennis Corbett Wilson in 1912. So he ended up setting off here early morning and probably just going out towards the Priscilla's there and hanging a left and then following you know, the ferry loop over to Ross Lear and on to Ennis Corfe and crash landing and hitting a stone wall. Quite a celebrity thing to do back in the day. There's always been like a sense of like journeying in this area, people arriving and taking off to new destinations. I think what is special about the area of Fishguard is like geology of the place. It's nestled between Great Britain's only coastal national park and then on the backdrop inland of that you have the Gwine Valley which is an ancient glacial valley leading up to the Priscelli Hills. It's got this amazing kind of mix of land and sea. I'm looking to try and fuse running in the landscape and writing music. Kind of creating compositions, I've been finding it interesting to also record the environment and recording like the River Gwine or further out to sea. Si pan dechreis i adrodd streion shemi wad i blant yn y dosbarth, pa mor boblogydd we nhw, enai'n meddwl am un funud y bydd eu plant dydd i'r rein a diddordeb ac awydd i glywed, ond y gwir we, os oedd nhw'n gofyn am fwy o hyd o hyd, wel na ni, mae'n rhaid bod nhw'n wych. Mae diddordeb da fi i greu adnodd ei weitho rhywbeth mas o ddim byd os gallai, dwi'n lico i'l gylch chi, er mwyn adrodd streon yr ardal i blant lleol, oherwydd na i trwy'r tadaeth nhw, bydd yn gas da fi i feddwl bod blant lleol yn gadael yr ysgol heb o bod am stori'r Frankwr a Jemima, am stori Dewi Sant, am stori'r Salas y Llongdrylliad, neu streon sem i wad. Maen nhw gyd yn rhoi lliw i'n hardal ni ac yn rhoi hynaniaeth i ni, yn dyfe. It's part of your identity. Chyma, it's straeo yn yr ardal. The stories of the area. Mae trio rhoi rhyw syniad o hanes leol a chwedlu'r ardal a rhyw ymwybyddiaeth o'i gwreiddiau i blant yn yr ysgol yn bwysig i fi, dwi'n teimlo fe yn y galon. I think once you've been brought up to that rhythm of the sea, you never lose it, it's in your blood. The tide comes and goes like it does here. Life's, life's a bit like that, you get high tides. 
The magic of living by the sea is makes you feel part of something bigger and port itself is a huge connection. Uh, so it's just always got this reminder of like things are happening all the time. Ma pobol even kapar gwein in gubod sport a porthlath ar song ferry in bui city of gaminet or dwar not kenta panel nur skolukhrad mar skolukhrad lanar brin in winepi er porthlath akman ungwel de song in meu na mas and vivol in vistol tour tem hore tour planete pride is definitely something you associate with the welsh it's really important to feel a part of where they live. You know, you hear a lot actually of the old community spirit. Well, it never died in Wales. That community spirit is alive and kicking, and especially in Fishguard and Goodick. When I was, I think, about 19, that's when I went to work on the ships. I joined the ships, I think it was 1961 till 1965. We weren't home much at all then, only, well, we lived on the ship really. We just got home on Sunday nights, had to be back down on the ship Monday morning. My connection to Rossley was well, my father was over there, my grandfather. They were born there, my father moved over here. Then he went back to Ireland. My grandfather, well, he lived in Ireland all his life, yeah. Obviously, Rosslear and Fishguard, um, kind of, they, they developed because of that desire to link Southern Ireland with, with London. Their whole purpose is, is for that, and obviously that that caused a, you know, a, a mingling of, of, of the populations. And just thinking back to when we were in um, primary school, sort of the, the Catholic church and the Catholic um, school in Fishguard were largely generated because of that Irish population. Um, but when, so when we were in school, there'd be lots of people with parents or grandparents who were, who were Irish. But you'd always see yourself as, as Welsh. And I'd still, I'm very sort of, proud of like my Irish heritage but I would always class myself as as Welsh and I think those traditions just blended I mean I remember we had we had nuns teaching us and they taught us Irish dancing but also oh, yeah. Welsh folk dancing so mm -hmm. you you went to the East Wales did you North Wales, yeah. so mm -hmm. I think it was that that sense of it of it yeah just just being being mixed really I think we just sort of accepted it. I, I think mm. it's only as you get older and you've moved away where you think about how sort of unique it was, but that that sort of life just carried on alongside whatever else that you were doing. I mean, obviously, lots of um, lots of family members and and you know friends were employed by the harbour, and it had a knock on effect with other with other industries as well, with with restaurants and hotels and things. But um, yeah, just sort mm. of coexisted didn't it that it was there <laughs> yeah and I think there was often the expectation sometimes that you know it, it was seen as one of the main employers wasn't it really at, at that yeah. time so um. yeah. I met my husband on the St David uh, when he decided to come back for the season and work on the ferries What's it's that? the two ships on that. Is that the David? The, the David and the Andrew, that is, yes. Uh, in the winter, they didn't need the two ships. In the summer, um, they were working together because there was extra trips. But in the winter, then one would be anchored out in the bay uh, until it was needed again. These are Mum and Dad's discharge books, aren't they, Mum? Yes. Yeah. And as we were looking through them, you can see the dates when they were both on the the David together then, isn't yeah. it? And you've got the dates, and that's that sort of shows where, where you met, really, isn't yes. it? But but it was it was nice looking back, and you could see that that date, wasn't yeah. it? That you started in exactly May '65, wasn't it? And Dad in yeah. in June, and that's where that's where you met. So today we're we're going to to meet Auntie Agnes, my dad's sister, um, and her daughter Lisa, our, our cousin. We haven't seen them for probably about two years now because we were going yeah, over quite be. quite regularly. Um, 
so yeah in that time it's going to be it's going to be so lovely to see them after all mm. after all that time I go visit my family in Fishguard, yeah, very regular. We go to them and they come to us. We're very close, really. Uh, Julie and Liz and Bob comes over to us and Marie. Marie's not a great traveler, so we didn't see her too often, yeah. From Ross Lear to Fishguard, I mean, uh, you go on board and then you go into duty free and you have a few drinks in the bar and then you have something to eat. And it's really, it's really part and parcel of a trip, really, of a holiday, you know. It's what you make it, I suppose, like everything. And then you arrive at Strumble Head, and then you see Fishguard, and then you're in the harbour in, in Goodick. It feels the same as being home, really, you know. It's, yeah, it's really no different, no. I love the sea. I hit Ross Lair and I really, it seems as if I get light in the head. It's just, it's the sea. I, I suppose I'm cancer is my blood sign, but they say it's a water sign, I don't know. But anyway, I do feel great at the sea, you know. The boys from Fishguard, most of them grew up with me in Ross Lair, if you know, and then they married people from Fishguard. So we all kind of knew one another, and it was very, it was, the camaraderie was great there, you know, and it was great fun. And they used to kind of joke one another and, you know, do silly things on one another, and, you know. I first met Michael, my husband, on uh, the ferry going to Fishguard. I was going over to my um, niece's christening. And uh, I met him and somebody introduced us. And they said, this is Leo Todd's sister. So that was all right. And we spoke for a while. And then I didn't see him anymore till I went to work. <laughs> when I was working there then, and we met again. And that started the whole thing off, yeah. I worked in the tourist office in Wexford. The office was open for about two hours. Well, it was greeting some of the passengers and if they were going to Ireland, they'd come over and see, you know, where we would think they'd like to go. And, and uh, my uniform was, uh, it was a dress, short. Well, not that short, but that was the fashion. And um, short sleeve, the little jacket and a nice hat, little, little hat. Yeah, it was lovely. It was a tweedy, Irish tweed, yeah. really exciting going over it. it. It did feel feel like an adventure, you know, the excitement of seeing my gran and my great uncle lived in the same house as well, so that was always, always special. I think anyone who lives by the sea, it's almost in your DNA. You just love the place. I'm, I'm always fascinated by the fact that we all have this kind of sense of belonging in whatever little tiny part of the world we live in. There's nowhere like home. 
remembering back in, in kind of the history of, of Rasselaer Harbour, there was very little activity here. I think it was 1846, there would have been a lot of talk about the suitability of Rosslare Harbour as a port. It was the best part of 50 years before it was officially opened as a, a port and a railway. We're very fortunate geographically, the location of Rosslare Harbour was just right for the development of a big port. I was born and bred in Rosslare Harbour. My memories are all about the pier and the ships and the fishing boats and the people who worked on the pier. My father was uh, worked all his life on the pier for uh, British Rail. The original entrance um, to the harbour was by a viaduct and it had two railway lines in the middle, a pedestrian walkway on the right, a cattle grid on the left, which um, the cattle were assembled down here and they used to go out along the walk, cattle walk, and under, underneath the harbour there was um, a cattle creek, they called it, and straight onto the ships for export. The inhabitants of Rosslea Harbour are proud, resilient, and very friendly. And their place, place in Irish history, they're very proud people. They've come through tough times, up to the 50s and 60s, and they've come through that, and then they've had recessions like everybody else, and they've worked their way through that as well. The spirit of volunteerism is amazing, and when you walk around here, we have our memorial park, we have lovely trails along the top of the bank. These are all the result of community getting together. Well, this is Kerwin's Gardens, and um, about 30 years ago, his garden just backed onto this particular area here that I'm standing in, and he just started pottering away and um, took an interest in trying to sort it out. And, and over the last 30 years, it has just developed. And um, I'd say about 15 years ago, the local environment group um, became interested and they have a band of people now who work here probably on a daily basis and have developed the paths and introduced new shrubs and flowers. And now it has been transformed into really what has become a tourism attraction for Rossler Harbour. I'm from Wexford. I am Wexford born and bred. Um, I know this area very well. I grew up here. Here in Wexford, like we have a track record of uh, welcoming people into our community, but particularly Rosslare, like Rosslare, not just because of the port, um, but because of the history of the place. Diversity is something that we grow up with here in Wexford. You're sitting in um, an ancient barony called Forth, and there's another barony right next to us called Bargy. And Forth and Bargy were the, um, the Wexford Pale. So when the Normans came in 1169, the, the area was settled. So we've had, from that time, we've had Flemish, Old English, Welsh, uh, French, Dutch and Frisian all lived in this area here as well. So these two barneys, which is around the Rosslare area, has always been, through history, been a very diverse culture. In the last eight century, when the whole island of Ireland has become quite diverse and it's absolutely brilliant, it's brought so much to, to our country. No matter what part of Ireland you go to, uh, people will talk about their own microclimate. But I think we have a bit more science on our side down here in Rosslare. We tend to have a different weather pattern than uh, even the, the greater Wexford area. And it's, it's not strange to be sitting in this park here and watch rain just, just, just miss us, just go by, you know, and not arrive here. here now in Kirkloa, we're right almost at the southern tip of Ireland, so it's just kind of nestled in behind Rosslare. But I think the river and the fact that, um, that we're right down just that little bit more south in Ireland creates that kind of a little bit of a microclimate. When we do get surf, it really has to kind of come up, it has to be quite strong from the south. So what we're really looking for is storms that hit France and will drive a bit of swell right up from the south. You're kind of working towards something always with surfing, so you're always getting better and you can always challenge yourself. 
just doing something for the sake of doing it right now and enjoying it right now and they're the reasons that, that, that I like going into the water anyway. So when I'm out in the water, like definitely one of the, the most uh, common, uh, I suppose, little friends that you'll have out there would be the, the seals coming up to you and like they'll come, they're really curious, especially if there's a bit of swell in the water and it'll churn up the kind of silt uh, from the river and the water might be a bit murky and they know you're there but they don't know how far away you are and they'll come up right beside you and they just want to see who, because you look like a seal as well with your hood up and uh, in, in, the, in the wetsuit as well, you know, you look like a little seal so they don't, they're kind of like, what are you, what are you doing and what are you doing here? <laughs> When I came down here, I just fell in love with the beach. It's on lots of people's bucket lists to be able to ride a horse on the beach. There's just something really magic about that. I don't know where, where it has come from, but I've always loved horses, every aspect of them. I suppose I've worked with show jumpers. I've been, been involved in racing a little bit. To me, it doesn't really matter. I just love the horses. I'm not sure what it is, but Irish people certainly seem to have a really good relationship with young horses, producing horses. It seems to be a very natural thing here in Ireland. It's really, really super here to have the coastline because it's fabulous for the horses' mentalities. I think probably being so close to the port it obviously brings a lot of people from England and from Wales. It's very accessible to come over here for short trips. And we get quite a lot of people coming, you know, with family. And they can come and stay for a couple of days. It's not a big journey across. But you're still going to another country, you know. So the port makes it very accessible for those kind of visitors coming in here. Because of the port, you get a, a lot of people travelling to and from the port and because I play music, it's, it's extra special because a lot of people are coming in and they listen to the music and we're in the pub and, and play a few tunes. Playing sessions like we're sat down in a, in a chair, like and you're not on stage, you're not mic'd up. The visitors love that. They've never seen this type of thing and it is lively. It's a whole culture, it's a whole way of life and it's fantastic. It's to do with my own feeling about the pipes. I just have a passion for that sound. And also, County Wexford would be the home of Illan Pipe, and really, this is where it kind of all started, going way back with some of the traveler, traveling men. They were pipers. We went from the 80s up to the 90s, and you had river dance, which was a great revival of Irish music, but in a different sort of a sense. It took on a new uh, format, and it was mixing with other, other types of music, which I think helps it to keep alive. Like, we are the first port to call for Europe onto our island. So we're the first Irish people that have so many other countries visit. Like you can come directly into Ross Airport now from so many different parts of the continent as well as the UK. We're the first Irish people people see. We're also the last if they're going home that way too. One of the things that really strikes me about a place like this is the family connection and the way that families have stayed here in Ross Harbour fourth generation now and people don't move away. We're only caretakers, you know, we're only here to, to look after our land for the next generation. And I think that's so true here. I think people have a real respect for Rosslare Harbour and its environment. Bladderack by Greg Howes forged from the fire of the Napoleonic Wars, a new harbour was born, red upon the rock for Pembroke, a dock. As the shipyard grew strong, the clevi did throng with boats and beaters of steel. Before 1814, Pembroke Dock was little more than a, a fishing village, a very sleepy fishing village. But after 1814, it became a naval dockyard. 
hundreds of ships were built here and it became of national and worldwide significance. One of the historical points in there is these wonderful gun towers we've got behind us. There are a few of them in the haven, in the, uh, in the waterways leading out, and there's another one at Tembe. And uh, they were actually completed midway through the 19th century, or the plans were, were drawn up for them many years before. Uh, I think since the Napoleonic War, we've always had a fear of, of being invaded. By the time that these things were actually finished off in the mid 19th century, the threat from the sea had, had long gone really. So they became sort of white elephants almost instantly. It does give me a sense of freedom and it makes me feel alive. And it's quite nice to just feel completely immersed in the waters of life. And it's nice to sometimes see what you're actually swimming with as well. The water around these areas are normally quite clear and you'd be surprised at what you do see in the sea. Weaving our way over the waves, we look north to see Milford spreading forth, its wings wide across the haven's dew. As the promise of wide waters beckon, we see St Anne's upon the mount, a legend to reckon, a lighthouse most fair. I've always dreamt of working on a, on a seabird island. This place, its cliffs are full of birds, it's noisy, it's smelly, it's, um, yeah, there's an absolute cacophony, I love it. It's, um, it, yeah, it's the, the largest Manx Shearwater colony in the world. So we've got 40% of the, the world population of Manx Shearwater nest here on Skoma, and and at night it is just, it is alive with the sound of them. It's, it's an exciting place to be and I've always, yeah, always sort of dreamt of living on an island. I think I, um, I read, I read too many, too many adventure books when I was a kid, I guess. So if you were crossing on the, on the ferry over to Ireland and passing by, then yeah, you might see some of the, some of the birds that we have nesting here. Um, you also, being that little bit further out, it's, uh, you could potentially see not just common dolphin, but maybe Risso's dolphin, if you were really lucky, um, minky whale potentially, which, uh, which would be pretty cool. Uh, we actually, um, yesterday there was, a, there was a sighting in the area of a humpback whale. Now that would be very unlikely, but, um, but the ferry also passes quite close to, to Grasham. Island and this is the the third largest gannetry in the UK so it's really significant internationally for the northern gannet so hopefully um, people on the ferry will be able to to, to see and, and potentially even to hear the, um, the the birds there and to and to watch them diving which is an incredible sight. Greet the islands where men are no more just ghosts and mists upon the shore. A wild and winged crown. Puffins, gannets and chuffs rise regally from a turquoise gown. Songs of saints and ogham script. Wrecks and reeves, smugglers and thieves. Fishermen and mermaids, tails tall and wide, spun upon a dolphin's hide. Bladderack to Ireland and back. Sandpipers at Rasslair by Bernard O'Donoghue. The standard procedure is to fill up with petrol just past the long scenic drop down into Dungarvan, to drop the bags at the Rosslare Lodge and drive to the beach behind the ferry port where our boat is all business preparing to set off. Well over the years I've done fishing and canoeing and sailing and I've hiked along the shore, the sights and the smells I find magnificent. 
and even on a calm day the sea can be calm in different ways and when the sea is wild it can be really wild. Our patch of sea here is one of the dodgiest patches of sea you'll get anywhere between here and Tusker. The waves coming from all sorts of directions, all different directions and the way they interact with each other. Even mariners, master mariners from far away remark on how this patch of sea has amazed them. So it's an interesting spot. It will reach Wales and then cross back for us to embark in the morning. As the twilight deepens, the on-off of the Tusker light finds its range. We are watching a stone chat swaying precariously on its perch. There are lots of wading birds along these shores. Red shanks, which are named for their red legs and green shanks, which are named for their green legs. But we also have one called the sandpiper. And uh, the sandpiper, no doubt, is named for his whistle or tune. Now, if you're far out at sea, maybe between Ireland and Wales, you'll see plenty of seabirds, particularly gannets and auks. If you're on a trip on the ship, you're guaranteed to see them. And sometimes seagulls will follow the ships all the way from Wales to Ireland and back again. At the water's edge, a small flock of sandpipers is pattering to and fro, letting us almost catch up, then shrilling off in a sparkling V of flight to settle on a new ridge of sand 50 yards ahead. This is where they live. It's where they will be when we next start out from this same perfect point of departure. When you live by the sea, you can smell it, you can hear it, you can see it. And if you go for a swim in it, you can taste it sometimes. And of course, the sea appeals to all the senses. Lots of people in these parts, when they've been away for maybe only a day, they have to come down to the top of the bank and have a look at the sea, as if they fear that the sea might have disappeared when they've been gone. <laughs> yes, I do feel a strong connection to the sea. I always have done, ever since I was a young child. Uh, I've always found it an inspiring place to be, a beautiful place to be. You know, the water holds what is unseen, the unconscious, and the land is very much the conscious. And the strand line, if you like, is like what's left behind by the dream. So you get the flotsam and jetsam, they're neither sort of known or unknown and where they come from. And that's sort of like the debris when you wake up from a dream. That's how I view the strand line. I grew up about as far inland as you could get in Scotland. Uh, so visiting the sea was always, it was always a big deal. I've never lost that love for it. So the fact that here I can, I can see the sun rise over the sea and then I can just go to the other side of the island and see the sun set over the sea, it's, uh, it's absolutely incredible. I love, the, I love all of the wildlife associated with the sea, but I love the sea itself. It's, um, it's, it's an incredibly powerful force. Uh, it kind of it diminishes everything else in contrast. The land for Pembroke Dock was purchased in 1814. The dockyard then came later. The dockyard actually produced five royal yachts, over 200 warships, and in the 1800s and into the 1900s, to think that Queen Victoria actually commissioned five royal yachts this far west it's just amazing. You don't think of a little town like Pembroke Dock as having produced all of that. Pembroke Dock has had a, a rather strange history. Because my family's always lived here, stories have been passed down from father to son. When I was in a position to investigate them, that's what I did. 
Going back to my dad, one of the stories he told me, he said the Imperial Japanese Navy was born in Pembroke Dock. Oh, wow! And he said one of the officers planted a tree. When I had the opportunity, I followed it up and I found that the Japanese in the 1850s were a feudal state and they were totally isolated. Japan woke up and said, hang on, the big outside world is coming in, we'd better take notice. And they suddenly realized that China and Russia had steam navies. And they said, hang on, we must have a navy. They sent sons of samurai to Greenwich College, one of whom was a lad called Hehechiro Togo. He was sent down to Pembroke Dock. His ship was the Haiye. Now, Haiye was launched in 1877. The ship left Pembroke Dock with a Royal Navy captain, and Hehechiro Togo was her first lieutenant. And when they arrived in Japan, he found a ginkgo tree. He sent it back with a message, please plant this tree in the garden of my lodgings in appreciation of the kindness you've shown me. It was planted, it thrives to this day. Another story my dad told me was about sailors buried in Angle. And I found out that there were 10 Japanese sailors buried there, but they've got no memorial. So I got in touch with the ship owners who survived World War II and said, look, there's a grave of 10 of your sailors here. It's no memorial. I want to build a memorial. I designed it. I negotiated with the church to build it. And I thought, this is a Japanese war memorial. It must have a Japanese inscription. And I thought, well, I don't know Japanese. I heard about Yoriko, so I rang her up. I didn't even have to persuade her. She said, right. I'll do it straight away. About three years ago, local historian David James re-erected it in this beautiful granite memorial. I got involved with him in a way that liaising with stonemasons. In Japan, we write letters from top to bottom, from right to left. Whereas in Western world, you write sentences horizontal way, so totally different way. Initially, I didn't expect any Japanese people living here. And gradually I got to know there are more Japanese people living, but I didn't know anything about the, the history of an object like this, the connecting between two countries. And this is the pure act of kindness and thoughtfulness of the local Pembrokeshire people. I'm so, so amazed and uh, yeah, humbled and grateful. The thing that I enjoy and interests me most about Pembroke Dock is finding out all the things that happened here so many years ago. The Know Your Street project of Pembroke Dock was set up a few years ago, basically just to tell people about the street that we lived in, its history, the people who lived there in years gone by. And it seemed such an interesting project to get involved in that we, we just went along, not realising that our street was one of the longest streets in the town, as we later found out. I suppose you could say it's like a family tree for the whole street. It goes back to 1891 and a census in 1901. And it's interesting in as much as so many families live together, the extended families, mother-in-law, father-in-law, brother-in-law. Well, in the case of my family, just up the street, they had six children in the cottage. Certainly an insight into how things were years ago. I wanted to do this partly to protect the heritage and the history, but also my own history because my grandfather's brother came to live in this street in early 1900s. I love the thought that some of my relatives actually walked along here when going into work in the dockyard. An uncle who was a blacksmith, his two sons who were shipwrights, they all walked along this street along with probably hundreds of other people over the years. Children waiting for their, their fathers to come out or walking in, perhaps on a Sunday, going to the, the, the dockyard church. All these memories, all these, these thoughts, these ideas, 
the stories. It's absolutely wonderful. It's all untapped, really. There's so much, so much more, not just what's happening today. I got elected to Premiership County Council at the age of 19. I wanted to give back to the community that I grew up in, sort of the people that I come to knew and the place I came to love. Pembroke Dock really is quite a sort of new town. It's, you know, over 200 years old, but that's quite new in terms of, you know, sort of most modern towns. It hasn't been around for that long, but there's just so many stories of people out there that if you just walk down any street, you can guarantee that everyone's got something different and unique to say. So when I'm running, one of the things I like to do is I like to run sort of around the whole kind of historical assets. You know, when you run alongside the port wall or when you're running through sort of some of the old buildings sort of in Pembroke Dock, you're actually sort of in the middle of that history. And when you look around yourself, you can kind of see the story of Pembroke Dock. You can kind of see how it's developed. The defensible barracks here behind me is a grade two star Victorian era build. So it was built in the 1840s to actually house the Royal Marines in Pembroke Dock. So this building is pretty much almost 200 years old. It's actually surrounded by a dry moat as well. And the building is actually massive. So it's got a really good view, obviously over the waterway because it was used as a defensible barracks. But it's sort of a really sort of iconic building really that stands tall on top of Pembroke Dock. Behind these dockyard walls, in the western hangar of the spring of 1979, the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back was built. So it's kept as a huge secret, but the hangars are that big because they held the Sunderland flying boats during the war, that they were able to build a life-size replica of the Millennium Falcon to actually move and use in The Empire Strikes Back. If you look at Pembroke Dock and kind of where it grew, Imagine it just grew in the port and then slowly, slowly, slowly expanded from there. And when more housing was built, when more people were needed, that's when it started, grew out and out and out from there. The port, I think, is kind of the heart of Pembroke Dock. You still have this established town that kind of had grown and grown. And I think despite all of that, you've still got the port at the heart of it. And even today with the ferry terminal and still with people passing through, whilst things have changed, you could probably argue that they haven't. There are so many visitors who come back here because grandfather or great uncle or someone was actually stationed here during the war. So yes, it is a very transient place. People are forever coming to visit. Ports by their very nature, the people are transient. The ship comes in, people get off, people get on, the ship goes, more people come, more people go. So it's very fluid, but it's an interesting place. I think in the last few years, it's starting to find its own spark of vitality. And this is something that people like me and a lot of other people are trying to stimulate, you know. Come and see us, you don't know what you're missing. Dyma ddechrau cerbi, mae yna olion y fyma o hanner cant o dau crynion. Mae nhw wedi cael pobl yn byw'n nhw ers fil o flynyddodd, um, bron yn fi dor. Ond mae yna olion ar y safle yma yn dyn ôl llawer, llawer pellach. Mae yna olion yn mynd yn ôl um, tair mil o flynyddodd i'r oes efydd. Ond ar i gwybod lawr y lôn jyst i'r dde hon yn fy fi yma, um, mi o'n y waith copr. A mae yna rhyw syniad o dy pobl oedd yn byw o fy yma hefyd efo cysylltiad efo'r gwaith copr. Mi oedd y gwaith copr i ben, a oedd yna oes efydd i ben. Os da chi'n sbio allan um, tyn ôl i mi, Mi welwch chi bryniau wiclo yn y werddon. Ydych chi'n sbio i'r chwith, ydych chi'n sgweld eryri um, a, a mynyddodd Cymru yn fanna. Mae o'n le, braf, arbennig ac yn edrych yn edrych yn iawn. 
ta'n ni'n gwybod o orolion yma, bod na bobl ni'n byw yma 5 can mlynedd cyn Crist, a ta'n ni'n gwybod bod nhw dal i fyw yma 5 can wedi Crist. Oedd yna chi'r mil o fynyddoedd um, o bobl yn byw yma i gilydd. Mae'r adeilad sy'n ôl i ni yn mynd yn ôl i'r trwyddyn gan nifer ddeg, pedwariad gan nifer ddeg, dim hwn ydy yr rinion, ond ar y fan yma, dyma lle oedd, a dan ni'n mae'r eglws yn dal i chi'n nabod fel eglws sant cybi, yr nawdd sant cair cybi. Sy'n ôl i mi fan hyn mae um, cartra, Captain Skinner, a dan ni wedi sôn amdan y fo, mae o yn, yn, yn ffigwr em amlwg yn y dre. Um, o wedi colli lygad pan oedd o yn blentyn, ac wedyn yn y frwydra um, mae'n ei byniaeth America, um, i gollodd ei fraith hefyd. Felly, um, ar ôl hynny, mi o'r ffennodd i yrfa yn yr y, y llynges, ond mi ddod o i gael gybu i weithio fel captain ar y llonga y post. Oedd o'n uh, ddyn dydd o'r ôl, ddaeth o'n gyrraedd o gigfran fel um, uh, anifal anwes. Ac oedd o'n cerdded y gwpas y drema efo'r cigfran. Fel oedd o'n sa'ch chi'n meddwl bod mor ladron yn cario peiro, uh, pa, uh, parot. Mi oedd um, uh, Skinner yn cario yr uh, 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 cigfran. The park, it started life as a quarry, and the reason why a quarry was needed was to provide foundation rubble for the Hollyhead breakwater. And seven million tons of rock were taken from here to provide the foundation rubble for the Hollyhead breakwater. It was derelict for a while, and then there was a local initiative to create a country park. I think running enables you to see things, to feel things, to know things. This is a great location for running. This route is very special on the Afurter Kreipjog, the rocky coast. Uh, what's so special about it? Wow, the view. Look at the view. The view of the breakwater is stunning. You can see the shape of it and the sheer enormity of it, the sheer magnitude of it, the, the work that went into it, that never ever escapes you. I lived very much the same streets for about 50 years. I'm a Hollyhead boy through and through. Living in Waterside area where I came from, you tended to know everything about the, the lifeboats and those that were on the crew. And living in the street, you tended to know that there was chaps when the maroons went off. You know, you'd see them coming out of the houses and running down the streets and things. So I'd been brought up with all that. But when I was in the fishing, I had an angling party out at sea here and I got caught in my own anchor warp, pulled over the side, and it was only purely luck that I actually survived because a chappie passed me a knife just as I was going into the sea. But a couple of weeks after that, it really did make me take stock of everything and who would have come to get me, and I went to the local lifeboat station and I offered my services then. And I had the full time working for the Aaron Lies Coxon's position here in 2016. And when I see the youngsters coming in here now, and I see that passion, it does mean you know, it really means it to me to see them coming in and I think, ideal, I can hang up my boots, you know, it's, it's, I can move on now, you know, it's very good. I think what I'm passionate about is the buzz you get from saving a life. So you'll come back and if you get that person ashore safe, you feel fulfilled. When I wasn't joining, I could be lying in bed and I didn't know somebody was out fearing for their life. Now I can actually act on that because I'm part of the crew. It definitely feels special to be a part of the story. I look back at what people have done over the years and I have so much respect 
for what people have done in the past and I feel very privileged to be in the position that I am now where I can start making my own history. Hollyhead is the jewel of Anglesey, of UK sea kayaking. We've got some really spectacular and unique seas around here and lots of tidal races. And with some of that against various conditions, wind or some swell, can produce some pretty big seas. I've got a massive love for sea kayaking and you never quite know what you're gonna get out there. So excitement, anticipation, buzz, Ah, yes, it's all there. Hollyhead Coast Guard, just to advise, I am one single sea kayak heading out from Port Davach through the stacks back into Hollyhead Harbour over. Sea kayak Bolivar, this is Hollyhead Coast Guard. Many thanks for that, that ma'am. Have a good paddle and we'll speak to you at 2200 uh, to Hollyhead uh, out. So when I'm on a kayak, you're right down at that level of the seawater. It is a fantastic way to see wildlife. We have porpoise, we have dolphins, we've got some fantastic bird life, the guillemots, the razorbills, puffins, gannets, sheer water. We're guests in their environment, which is a very, very special place to be. Stack, in my opinion, is probably the most spectacular lighthouse. It's just incredible. Look up in awe at this incredible white lighthouse that always seems to be fresh and white and bright. It is absolutely beautiful. The cliffs, the little scaries you have, the rocks that jet out, the height. Every single time I paddle to or from Southstack, my heart will absolutely leap. Hi, good evening, Hollyhead Coast Guard. Just to advise, I'm back in Hollyhead, off the water. Over. Hollyhead Coast Guard, Roger, many thanks. Mae lot o canol y dre wedi newid, mae'r ffordd o weithio wedi newid, um, ond mae'r bobl yn dal y rhyfath. Y pobl siwr torra yng Nghymru ydy'r pobl sydd yn gwneud i chi, sydd yn helpu chi, sydd yn helpu allan, sydd yn dall i gilydd, a dyna beth sydd yn, 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 yn mor arbennig am y dre yma. I used to love hearing the sound of the trains going in and out of the town. It reminded me of travel, people going places, people coming here for a visit. There's a sense of things happening. You feel connected with the rest of the world. To somebody who's never been, Hollyhead's a community. It's people welcoming you, people supporting you, people coming together. And then it's a beautiful place. Hollyhead's much more than a place just to jump through on your way to Ireland. But just step outside of that. You know, instead of turning right, go straight on and you'll come to the sea. You'll come to the lifeboat station, you'll come to the harbour, and you're unlocking those wonderful little secrets that Hollyhead hides. When you come in from sea, you, you see the town nestled underneath the mountain. It's got absolutely everything. It's a complete and utter gem. Blasted from my side, a stone child breaks the water like a finger of fossils through the flood. 
holding back trouble, sea serpents and storms, cradled and battered in the mussels and the mud, and horizon beyond my great Wicklow sisters, tied to the crag of their land, freeing the rain, falling on sails, driving through and stabbing in the sand. And still, they wave goodbye. Mor daithiai. I was bred in Dublin, but I was born in Birmingham, and that's uh, really interesting because my parents in the 50s had to take the boat uh, because there was no employment here in Ireland, so they emigrated to England, uh, as did thousands of others. Um, I was born in Birmingham, but don't hold that against me. I was born in Birmingham, and after a year and a half, came back to uh, live in Dublin. My, both my parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, unusually, are all from Dublin. So it's very much uh, my town, my city. Um, and it's, it's where I live and it's, it's a place I love. From here to Hollyhead is interesting for me because to me it's been a lifeline um, for the city, not just the city, the whole, the whole of Ireland because people gravitated towards the city to get to the port to take the boat. Um, it has connotations for me of unemployment, especially in the, as I say, the 50s and 60s and 70s. My parents had to leave Ireland in the 50s because there was no work. They emigrated, they took the boat, they found employment in, in, in Birmingham. And also the boat was used, it was the mail boat, it was the cattle boat. So it was a lifeline, people who were working, um, often husbands went away to work in England and their wives stayed at home and they mightn't get home maybe once a year and they sent their money back on the mail boat uh, through letters and stuff like that. So to me the boat signifies a connection, an ongoing connection between Ireland and, 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 and the UK. It's a crossing and it's a journey, but it doesn't seem like it because it's so quick now. You know, yeah, the speed, especially from Dublin to Holyhead, it's, it's faster than it is the other way back. And you feel yourself kind of propelled, and I mentioned that in the, in the poem. You know, you're on the boat and you, you feel the shuddering of the engines and the power of it underneath you, and you're walking around. Then you go outside and all of a sudden you realize you're being, being you know, catapulted out into the, into the bay and into Dublin. And then you look behind and you see the city that you're leaving behind. And then in an hour, an hour and a half time, you see ahead of you, you see Wales. It's, 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 it's brilliant, you know, it's, um, it's exciting. It's a great journey, actually. Yeah, you know, as you're arriving back to Dublin on the ferry, everything is in widescreen. Uh, and it, you're kind of drawn into this. It's like watching a movie and you're coming closer and closer into it. And you pick out pieces in the distance, you pick out Hold Head, you pick out Darky Island, you then coming in, and as you get closer, you're seeing Sandy Mount, you're seeing Rings End, you're seeing Rahini, you're seeing Hout Clontarf, and all of a sudden, bang, you're in, and you're getting off the boat, and you're home. Waving from the whirl of the water in the strum of the salt green sea, hauled in from Ireland, the waves curling, hurling them home to me. In a forest of masts, then of funnels, all fishermen and flying into morning. Past the anchored sun, floating, the light of the sky and the sailor's warning, they sail by. Agosai. Oh gosh, I remember the Hollyhead in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I can remember the lowing of the cows coming off the cattle boats extremely happy growing up in Holyhead um, uh, but it was messing about on boats all the time nearly. Um, have you ever heard of the climber Joe Brown? Um, he was a world famous climber, a Welsh climber in the 1970s in between South Stack and North Stack at a set of cliffs. The BBC filmed it all by lowering cameramen down in cages on either side of Joe uh, climbing up and we had a tug offshore with a film crew as well. Unfortunately, the film crew were violently seasick and no film <laughs> was produced from that tug station, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. <laughs> there is uh, one memorable trip. It was in the early 90s. I took my Brazilian in-laws over, completely forgetting that it was another country. And the Irish customs officer said, you do need passports. He said, oh, 
and you need visas. And it's, oh, ah, go on. <laughs> and so we had a lovely day in Dublin, thank you. <laughs> the connection with Holyhead and Ireland is very, very strong. We have Welsh, we have the Irish, we have English, we have Scots, we have Northern Irish, we have Dutch, the Dutch Navy was stationed there in the Second World War, we have Indonesians, we have Kazakhs nowadays, we have Russians, we have uh, a multinational uh, population, but it's still only 15,000, so uh, you can still go to any of them and ask for a cup of sugar. I heard guns. Not a foghorn one morn, the day's face in the cloud of a frown, the speed of a torpedo, the crash of a hull, it came and it sang blow the man down, but above, the boats in the wind, Cledachin wind, tracing the track on the back of a monster, a life anew for you, or dancing the jig to the horns of ships, a scouse terrace with a different view, nay, Aros yn Gymru, o dan yr awyr halen, a'r gwylioch o'r llongau gyda fi. Mae eich mordaeth wedi bod yn hir, so stay here and melt to the sea. I grew up in Holyhead and I write about Holyhead and the surrounding area, so Anglesey, Gwynedd, um, and for me, Holyhead's a really inspiring place, uh, which is why I'm here. A Holyhead's relationship to Ireland is really special. I think most people who live in Holyhead identify with Irish people. We feel connected. They're a little bit like part of our community, and that's not because they pass through it. Um, as you grow up, you know, there are pubs here, there are cafes here. You sit in a pub, you can happily have a chat with someone that's stopping over for you know an hour or two um, interesting relationships happen it doesn't feel like two countries actually in this port it feels like we're together Irish and Welsh the thing that's interesting about Holyhead is, is its sort of geography and the fact that it's an island off another island off another island so it feels that in parts there's, there's mysteries in the land and it's got this great big mountain that, that watches over us all I feel like it takes care of us it definitely plays a part in the way I write um, and you can't help when you live on an island if you're a writer, if you're a poet, you can't help but write about the sea. So yes, definitely. Uh, spending so much time with my family on beaches, running on the sand, climbing up rocks, that's definitely played a part in, in, in grown up me. Leaving the bay of my lover's outstretched arms, propelled purposely and speedily as if from the slingshot set between pool bags, redundant yet robust towers. Sensing the rumbling, rotating revolutions of engines below, surging up to the hulking force beneath, rising up through you as you move towards whatever destiny deems to be yours. Places visited now disappearing dismally, as if in a black and white showreel of summer's past. No anger, only angst reflecting in the water on what might have been if home had been another place. Unemployment lines of dull desperation determined your fate. A faraway fate denying freedom to fearful feminists, young but brave enough and scared enough to take this boat to furtive surreptitious places and practices, seeking a way to end something before it begins to take hold of lives unprepared and resourceful enough to provide traversing troubled times and waters to leave forever or return in silence, exile and cunning. For good news travels fast, disaster more daring, it dashes ahead. This boat is a lifeline no matter how often we must come and go. As with our river and sea, it ebbs and flows, it comes and goes, connecting our futures, our pasts, our friends, our foes.
We're on Strand Road, heading up the south cliffs of the Haute Peninsula on Dublin Bay. These are maybe the best conditions for human life in Ireland. And for 10,000 years, people have known that and they've been living up and down these cliffs. When the tide goes out, the intertidal zone explores all the food sources and all the nutrition and everything that you would need. And it has always been like that. By the end of the 18th century, the British had discovered that Dublin Port itself and Dublin Bay was too hostile to sailing ships because of the westerly winds. And William Bly was sent over after the mutiny on the bounty to survey Dublin and determine where would be the best place for a mail boat station for instant communications between Dublin and London. And William Bly decided that Hoth was the best place to build the mail boat station. I think it was the change to steam that led them to abandon it and that harbour was pretty much left to rot, but we still have it and we still have this beautiful little harbour. I think it's important to preserve the history of the port because it's intrinsic to the identity of the whole country. Everything that was going in and out of the country came through the port. So this is uh, the bottle boy and it used to be O'Connor's and it was the most famous uh, north side pub for dock workers. Back in the day, workers would come in every day, it was casual work, so they'd come in in the morning at eight o'clock to what's called the reed, where the foreman would select out individual dockers for working that day. People who didn't get selected on the eight o'clock reed would have to come back again at 10 o'clock. So in between times, the only place they had to go to was the pub. Pubs in the docks area had uh, permission to open at seven o'clock in the morning, so they were called early houses. This pub was um, had a special back room that was reserved just for dockers, um, and it was also invitation only. So if you were a young guy starting here, you knew you were in if you'd got an invitation to come in here, particularly on a Friday night, that was the best night for the crack. Probably the best informed people about global geography were dockers because they were handling all of these loads that were coming in. So all these exotic timbers and fruit and they knew where they were coming from, where the ships were going to. So they would have had a great awareness of what the, the world was. So I worked with my dad quite a bit because he wanted to teach me the ways of slinging different types of cargo. And then when the machinery started on the docks, it became a necessity to learn how to drive the different types of fork trucks. As the times moved on, the general cargo began to fizzle out a little bit. It all became containerization. So to move with the times, the first thing was to learn to drive one of the small fork trucks. And then the machinery got a little bit bigger. I was lucky to get one of the permanent jobs driving one of the big, we call them empty container handlers. I worked with a, with a gang and out of the gang there was maybe six or eight of us who drove the big machinery and we became our own little family and each of us knew more about each other than our wives knew about us. I would go back and start from day one all over again and I wouldn't do anything else. I was born and reared on the docks of Dublin. Everything was nearly cobblestone on the docks at the time. That was a Dublin in the 1950s to me. We done bulk bags, timber, steel, you name it. And then the containers come in. Everything was containerized. What you see behind me here now, that's the world we live in. The box took over the docks. The box that changed the world. I've had some great crack down here. I worked very hard down here. I delivered goods all over Ireland. Every corner, every village, we delivered stuff to. Dublin was the main artery into the port itself, into the Dublin itself. I had worked previously in lots of sewing factories around Dublin. My father was a docker and he used to say to me, you'll have to get a union job, Kay. And he said, go down to Liberty Hall, see Mr Duff and tell him I sent you. So he brought us on, up on the lift and I said, my father sent me down uh, to get a union job. And he said, I've no job here for women, he said. And he said, well, actually, I've only got one job here at the moment, he said, and it's for down the Dublin Port Milling Company, but for, it's for a fella, a youth. And I said, well, I can do what you can do. And I think he got a bit fed up with us. 
he said, go down Monday morning and see a guy down there called Paddy Murphy. So we got down to the Dublin Port Milling Company and I couldn't believe when I got there. It was a big industrial, huge big place, silos, forklifts. When I got there, Paddy Murphy came out and he had a big red face. He said, I'm not looking for any women down here. And I said, well, where have been sent by Mr. Duff from the union? He said, you have a job. I bought you a job for youths here, no women. And I said, well, I can do what? I said, sweeping up, sure I could sweep up. He got fed up with me. I knew why he got fed up, right, he said. And by the way, he said, this was the best part, right, where we were leaving. You can't wear, you won't be able to wear mini skirts here, he said. The stairs are all over the place. So, yeah, all right, I said. He said, call into the office and get your jacket for your uniform. And then we started the following Monday. I was about 22 and I got a job down the port. And so I began on the East Wall, on the East Wall Road, I began as a dock runner. And so I began to work in the dock community and I absolutely loved it. And I miss it. And I go back down even just to reminisce sometimes. The sea brings everything to your doorstep. Getting ready to go for a paddle out to Docky Island. Um, and Bullock Harbour is quite a quirky little place, really. It's still home to lobster and crab uh, fishermen. It's one of the most popular spots for sea kayaking, really, in Dublin. And um, you can meet all kinds of characters down here. <laughs> Once you paddle out of the harbour, the whole place just opens up. Dublin Bay is a UNESCO biosphere, so as soon as you exit the harbour, you're straight away greeted by the birds, the seals. In the centre, you have the port, which is, you know, of course, full of history. Then, very close by, you have, for example, Docky Island. There you have 60 grey seals, you have dolphins, you have porpoises. So to have that kind of diversity in such a small space, I think makes Dublin Port a really special place. Around Docky Island was uh, at one time the main port for Dublin. And so it has all that amazing history going on, but it also has a colony of seals who are very playful, very curious and more than willing to interact when they feel like it with us. And there aren't very many places in the world where you can have that coexistence of capital city industry and a colony of seals. So I think that just makes it a, a very unique and special place. I'm a musician and I play the Yellen Pipes, which are the, the Irish bagpipes. I'm third generation Dublin. I'm very much a dub, very proud of my roots here in the city. What's interesting about the relationship between the port, which isn't, isn't direct with Irish traditional music because it was, a, it was very much a music that came from the country, from rural people. It, it grew in strength in the city in the early 20th century with, these, with this migration of people. But one thing that was always strong and remained strong in the city was piping. I have a relationship with this city. It's a thing that I'm linked to. So I, I kind of approach it that way, the way you would a friend. And I, I like to tell the places that I appreciate about it and the things I like about it. And I hope that it likes me back. <laughs> you're standing in the port and you're looking out there or at, you're at the beach and you've got the sea and the sky and this line. And you always ask the question, what's over there? I, I couldn't understand anybody growing up in a port city who wouldn't have that smell in the air, what's out there, you know? Whatever part of history that you might be interested in, you can walk the tale here. That journey of 10,000 years has only got as far as the last step you took. And so what you do is you take responsibility step by step for the next step in that journey.